DC Comics got nothing on us. After a full year of weekly episodes, we're launching our very own New 52 with an up-close look at director Zack Snyder's new movie, Army of the Dead. Was he able to wash the bad taste of his Justice League away? Let's find out. The byword starts now. Welcome back, nerds across the globe. It's time for a brand new oven fresh episode of the Nerd Byword. I'm Dave, here with my friend and co host Chris, and we're ready to bring the nerdy goodness to you. In today's episode, we're tackling the new zombie movie from director Zack Snyder, Army of the Dead. But first, we have to tackle our, open, tackle our opening segment. <laughs> Nerd That's right. Nerd news. Chris, what's good? Well, at long last, fans got their first tease of the upcoming MCU film Eternals, a movie that features a group of immortal beings with superpowers that have lived in secret throughout much of human history. They now come out of hiding to battle their nemeses, the Deviants. Created by Jack Kirby in 1976, the property returned to prominence with a seven-issue limited series by author Neil Gaiman and artist John Romita Jr., uh, in the mid-2000s, based on what was shown in the teaser, one may assume that the aesthetic of this film, combined with the influence of Academy Award-winning director Chloe Zhao, borrows heavily from this particular series. In anticipation of the film, Marvel Comics is currently publishing another volume of the title with writer Kieran Gillen and artist Asad Ribic. Many fans of the Marvel Cinematic Universe are hailing this film project as one of Marvel Studios' boldest endeavors, likening it to that of... 2014's Guardians of the Galaxy, featuring a roster of characters that are widely unknown to the general public. Uh, Dave, you weren't exactly taken with this trailer. It seems that we're going to have to step outside our echo chamber, so to speak, for this one. Well, look, I mean, to be completely honest, I am excited for this movie. And the fact that it's drawing on a series that was written by Neil Gaiman is obviously a plus since I'm a big Neil Gaiman fan. The cast is obviously phenomenal and the premise is pretty interesting. I'm glad the trailer also didn't give too much away. It's a teaser after all. I think where my disappointment comes from is just that I don't understand why nobody ever in any movie seems to be willing to go full Jack Kirby. You know, I love Kirby's bonkers visual style. It's so distinct and and historically has been colored in these bright popping colors. A movie that would be willing to hitch their wagon to Kirby's style would be probably one of the most visually distinctive and unique movies, period. And yes, I'm a DC fan more so than a Marvel fan, but this is not me belly aching about the MCU, which I really enjoy. I said the exact same thing about the depiction of the new gods in Zack Snyder's Justice League. It seems that Hollywood likes Kirby's ideas, but not his visual style. And I find that simply regrettable. I would love to see a movie go, you know, full Kirby ones. In the end, you know, the big costumed group shot uh, at the end of the trailer felt a bit visually safe when it could have packed a lot more Kirby punch. That's not to say, again, that I'm not interested in the movie. Uh, I just want some more Kirby on the big screen. I love his visual style, and it, it it never gets the respect on the big screen that I think that it deserves. Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I guess I'm the wrong tree to bark up with that. I, I'm personally, I know this is you know almost uh, I don't know uh, blasphemous, but I'm not a huge Jack Kirby fan. I appreciate his contributions to the medium of comics. It's just his art style is not to my particular taste. Um, I also am not a huge fan of like bright, vibrant colors. Uh, I, I I typically like you know the the black suit Spider Man. Um, I, I like darker colors. Typically, that's just for my personal taste. Um, and I just think that you know with the evolution of art over the years since you know this product was initially created and and Kirby you know was in his heyday i, I think just art has in, has evolved and i don't think that a lot of that translates very well to screen i think one of the few exceptions you have is something like thor ragnarok um but even then some critics say that that's not kirbyish enough 
Um, so I, I don't know where we where we find a happy medium at this point. I think this um, I think this particular entry, at least what I've seen of Chloe Zhao's work on on something like Nomad Land, it seems very very kind of in line with that. Um, you know, and combined with kind of the aesthetic that they're going for, kind of like a biblical type epic. Um, it, it seems kind of you know, uh, continuous with that kind of vision. Um, as far as like a full Kirby thing, um, I think it's, I think it's a slippery slope because when you, uh, at least the entries that we've seen where they try to go for those bright, bright colors and snappy things, it comes off as a little bit goofy. Um, I'm thinking of something, you know, along the lines of like the original Fantastic Four films from the early 2000s or, or something like that. So, oh, don't tell me now that you like the dark visual style of Fan Four Stick better. Come oh God, no! Uh, you know, like they, I, I believe in moderation. My life motto is everything in moderation, and that's the opposite end of the spectrum. That's absolute garbage. Where they, it's it's almost like um, when you when you drive on the side of the road and you trail off and you hit that that buffer. And, and you're like, oh God, and then you overcorrect. I think that's what that film is. It's an overcorrection, and you know that that film is just absolute nonsense. And I think the reason that I join you in my criticism of of the Zack Snyder verse is you have those muted costumes combined with several other factors like the poor CGI, uh, the slow motion, and then also overwhelmingly the dark lit environment like it's hard to see anything in a lot of those scenes you have like a black sky and and you know we'll get into this a little bit with our our film review of army of the dead but it's hard to see anything it's like that one episode of game of thrones where it's like did somebody forget to pay the light bill good god i can't see anything so i don't think that this film is going to to fall into that um but but i i definitely see where you're coming from well, and when it comes to, you know, bright, uh, you know, popping colors don't work on the big screen. I actually love the visual style of Thor Ragnarok. And that <clears throat> particular uh, interpretation always, you know, doesn't really land with me just because my all time favorite dude on the big screen is, is Superman. And the best Superman suit by far, uh, to my liking, at least was Chris Reeves, which was exactly that, that bright popping color in a really vibrant, bright world. But you know, that's not even really the ultimate problem. I mean, to me, when you're talking about uh, a property like the Eternals, which is, you know, these these ancient, you know, basically almost godlike creatures, you know, they've been around forever. It seems so odd to me that they would dress basically like, um, almost perfectly in line with, with the, um, general visual aesthetic of the rest of the MCU like these these uh individuals have been around forever and and have you know traveled the universe and you would think that they'd be a little more outlandish in some of those visuals but again they're trying to take a property that is pretty unknown and they're trying to kind of file down some of the uh, eccentricities of it to try to make it land with the general public and I understand that again I, I would be thrilled to see something one time that's just absolutely bonkers Kirby on the big screen because with modern special effects I think something like that could be a real spectacle and unique for a change which is one of the criticisms I think um, fans fairly I think uh, level at Marvel Studios sometimes is that a lot of their stuff kind of falls into the sort of samey category everything has a sort of almost a house visual style and everything is kind of well, well, say me, I guess is the best way to put it, which, you know, is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, if, if you got a good hamburger, you're probably going to go back for more. Um, and the MCU delivers good stuff. But I just this this was a property, I think, that could have really, you know, visually at least stepped further away from the house style. Yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And that's one of I think when you're trying to thread the needle and correctly interpret the, the comic book source material and and yet and still trying to cater to larger audiences uh, i think it's a very difficult needle to thread and with some mcu entries um you know it really hits and it's fine and then other ones it kind of lands you know with a, with a dud and that's why i have like so much respect for them to be willing to take the risk they did with something like wandavision uh that is just completely out of there out, out there and some something completely new and and like you haven't seen before yeah, absolutely. I was a big fan of WandaVision. It was it was stylish, 
visually unique, ha- had an interesting uh, storytelling rhythm to it. That That's the kind of stuff I think I'd like to see more from the MCU. All right, Dave, you're going to uncharted territory for me, Overwatch. Okay, so uh, bear with me. Uh, for those listeners who uh, are familiar with the game Overwatch, this is going to make a whole lot of sense. For those of you uh, that are not as familiar with the game, uh, it, it might sound like you know, like so much nonsense. <clears throat> so we've talked at length about how much uh, Chris and I both dislike online multiplayer generally. That's not to say that there are not cases when I put up with it to enjoy a really good game. And that, to me, was the case for several years with Blizzard's excellent hero shooter, Overwatch. I'll freely admit to sinking many hours into the online-only game. I made some friends, got cursed out and insulted, but overall, I had a really good time with the game. As a fairly new father now, I don't exactly have the time to do the Overwatch loop anymore, but I'm still following the news of the upcoming sequel, Overwatch 2, with great interest, having been a part of that whole community for so long. So Blizzard recently dropped a bit of a bombshell. In the sequel, they will be reducing team size from six people to five. That's a massive shift inside the game. In the past, the game basically required two tank heroes, two DPS or attack heroes, and two healers. So it was a 2-2-2 configuration for each team. Under this new configuration, one tank spot has been dropped. Now, on the one hand, this will uh, probably speed up gameplay and make it more intense. On the other hand, so-called off-tanks, those characters who are technically tanks but not primarily focused on shielding others, are pretty ill-served by this meta. Characters like D.Va, for example, cannot currently fill a sole tank spot effectively. So in, in the old configuration, you'd have you know a main tank, something like an Orisa or a Reinhardt that can shield characters effectively, and then an off tank that's a little more mobile uh, and a little bit more uh, attack-oriented for a tank. And, and that's just out. That That's no longer possible. So... Basically, it feels like the reduction in team size will also lead to several characters becoming less viable in the game, unless Blizzard is willing to do some significant reworking of those characters. And I think that's a shame. I mean, part of the appeal of Overwatch is that there is a hero and a playstyle for pretty much anybody, um, knocking out a whole bunch of heroes now out of the rotation because they don't fill... Uh, that one particular tank role of shielding, you know, other players. I th- I don't know if that's necessarily a smart choice. So I'm still watching as more news unfolds, but I'm unsure as a pretty seasoned Overwatch player whether I really enjoy this change, Chris. Okay, so here here I was worried, but but you're speaking my language. It's just just a different game, so I know all about. Uh, for those of you that don't know, DPS is is damage per second. So you, when you're building a character or or gear, you want to go for heavy attack, lower defense, and 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 then you know tank will absorb that damage, and then of course healer is pretty self explanatory. So this this you know I'm very familiar with this terminology. It's just a different game. I played I played uh, the Division Two, and it was basically the same thing when you're team building. Um, and and that was by and large the one online multiplayer game that I enjoyed the most, and I was lucky enough to find uh, some good teammates uh, in Division Two. But um, so yeah, that that really is like a significant thing when you think about you know you have you're relying on two tanks to take the majority of the damage, and then just completely removing one of those. That's a that's a significant shakeup. Yeah, and you know, I'll, like I said, I'll be watching it pretty carefully just to see how that shakes out. I did read um, there's a workshop mode in Overwatch where fans can kind of make their own game modes, and they've already made a game mode that kind of implements those changes so they can test it out. And and some of the players seem to be um, you know pretty positive on the changes. Some are pretty negative. There's also, of course, the question of Overwatch League. Now, there is you know professional league of Overwatch players now, and a lot of the teams basically now don't need half of their tank players so <laughs> so that is a significant change for them as well there might be some uh, some loss of employment there as well so this is this is a pretty significant change as far as the world of video games is concerned yeah for sure it's 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 almost like a if it ain't broke don't fix it it's, it makes you wonder why they would want to shake something up so much like this Oh, Overwatch, Chris, has a horrible history for shaking up constantly. I mean, this is probably one of the most significant changes in recent years. But, you know, when the game first came out, 
besides, you know, dropping new heroes occasionally, I mean, they would go in and completely rework some heroes to the point where players who mained those characters found them suddenly unrecognizable and had to learn how to play that character again from the ground up. So Blizzard has a long history of constantly changing and rebalancing Overwatch. Uh, I'm not shocked that they would make a change like that. Just still not sure if it's the right move in my book. All right, that's it for Nerd News. When we come back, it's time for the main event. An in-depth review of Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead. Don't go anywhere. Hi, I'm Karen. And I'm Colleen. And this is Books, Movies, and Musicals. Oh Oh my. Come join us as we discuss our favorite childhood stories in analytical and honest ways. Most recently, we've been discussing Harry Potter and Disney princesses. We have so many more ideas and we can't wait to go through them with you. So keep it magical. And leave a little magic wherever you go. Bye. Bye. And we're back and ready to talk about Zack Snyder's new film, Army of the Dead. In the Netflix original flick, after a zombie outbreak in Las Vegas, a group of mercenaries takes the ultimate gamble by venturing into the quarantine zone for the greatest heist ever. The movie stars Dave Bautista, Ella Purnell, Tig Narato, Matthias Schweighöfer, and Garrett Dillahunt, among several other noteworthy actors. As always, when Chris and I review a movie, we'll be diving into three things we each liked about the movie, as well as three things we disliked before delivering our final verdict. Let's do this thing, Chris. What did you enjoy about Army of the Dead? Give us your first like. Uh, You know me, I'm a big theater buff, so I I really enjoyed the cast, and and I was excited to see Dave Bautista kind of take the lead role. Uh, You know, I've mostly seen him uh you know as a supporting character and things like guardians of the galaxy to see him front and center was really really cool and see him kind of flex his muscles pun intended in in a different role was awesome but uh i thought that the the rest of the cast was really strong as well there were particular characters that i just immediately clung to and it was just awesome and it was a bunch of like um people that i had seen in other stuff reminded me that i really need to go watch power um with amari hardwick I absolutely adored his character of, of Van Der Rohe. Um, I, I thought our, our guy, our guy Hiroyuki Sanada came back. Uh, Scorpion was was the uh, was was Mister Tanaka. That was really cool. I I I pray at the altar of Tignataro every single day. Like I absolutely love her work. Um, she's my favorite character on Discovery. Uh, and, and then just like the, the rest of the cast was a lot of people I haven't seen before. And I thought that they were really, really strong. And I really dug the ensemble that they, that they built with this. So, um, it, you had some really, I thought that it was a really interesting kind of, it was a very 2021 type of film with the types of characters. You had the internet influencers, um, you know, who were doing it for, for fame and, and even more so than the fortune. So I thought it was a really, uh, a really great cast. Um, and, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. The casting director deserves a raise on this one for sure. Overall, I love the cast. Uh, it also had a bit of an international flavor, which I really appreciated. There was a, a French actress, there was a German actor, there was a, an Indian actress involved. I appreciate that a great deal, you know, diversifying your cast a little bit. Now, Batista uh, is always fun on the screen. Uh, And I was very, very psyched too to see him in a lead role here. I remember reading that he actually turned down a bit part in uh, James Gunn's Suicide Squad uh, in order to take the lead role in Army of the Dead. And I think that was a good choice for him. Uh, He was really due a a lead spot in a movie. Uh, I think he's he's shown his skills several times now. You know, I, I really think, although I love Dwayne The Rock Johnson, I think Batista has done a much better job in picking roles post-wrestling. He really uh, pops up in a lot of stuff that lets him show off his range as an actor, gets to diversify a little bit. Um, I, I remember him popping up, I think, in Blade Runner 2049 in, in a very unique role for him. So, yeah, I think the casting was top-notch. I totally agree with you, Chris. I just love... I just love, you know, I, I look nothing like Dave Batista, unfortunately, but but the fact that he's just like a dad 
struggling, has to put on his glasses to read something. I, I identified with so much with that, you know, having to work at a burger place. Like it was, it was super enjoyable to see like this big, you know, muscle bound dude, you know, flipping burgers. It was just really cool to see. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Dave, what is your first like of this film? Okay, I think there's a scene in the movie that we really need to talk about because I think it's the standout scene, the best scene in the movie, really. So I wouldn't call Army of the Dead technically a horror movie per se, since it doesn't spend all that much time, you know, building tension or creating what I would consider truly scary moments. It's more of an action heist movie that happens to feature zombies. Now, that being said, there's one scene in the movie that actually feels like something from a horror movie. And it is, in my mind, the best scene in the movie. So you have the character of Chambers, played by Samantha Wynn, uh, confronting Martin, played by Garrett Dillahunt, about his shady behavior before the group has to sneak through a crowd of hibernating zombies. Batista's ward is dropping small lights on the ground to mark a safe path. Martin moves one of those lights, leading Chambers into a dead end surrounded by zombies who are slowly waking up. Now here, the tension that Snyder builds is perfect, as the audience is aware that Chambers is heading the wrong way, even though she's not. And then, one after another, zombie slowly awakens, and Chambers tries to silently take them out, only to slowly become overwhelmed as more and more zombies wake up. That sort of tension, that's horror movie classic right there. That's the kind of flavor I'm always looking for in a scary movie. And and Snyder, shockingly, just really did a very, very good job in racking up that tension. I really wish the movie would have featured more scenes like that. Now, the whole thing then explodes into a huge action piece and actually turns out into one of my favorite action set pieces in the movie. I mean, Chamber simply refuses to die every time you think she's done. She pops back up and keeps fighting for her life. The whole sequence just works. But those opening moments made me believe that Snyder actually could pull off an actual horror movie. So kudos. It was a fantastic scene. I loved, I loved that scene when she busts out through the window. You just assume she's dead, and then she busts out the window. It was so awesome. Uh, yeah, and and a lot of people are making a lot of jokes about how she's a direct lift from a, a character, I think, from Aliens. Um, but I, I thought that she was an amazing character, and just that dramatic irony of you know what Martin has done to stray her from the path, and she hasn't figured it out yet. It, it absolutely builds that your adrenaline starts pumping. And then you just, oh man, okay, she's dead. But then she busts out. I mean, she does, and, and ultimately, full spoilers, dying. But it was a, it was an awesome way to go out. The only thing about that scene that rubbed me the wrong way is the very end, right before she dies. She had an opportunity to warn somebody about Martin and didn't. Yeah. And that that kind of defied all logic in that moment. Yep. Like, either either the movie should have had her die in a way that she would never have the opportunity to speak or she should have been able to get off a warning about Martin. Otherwise, it just it just came across as this incredibly competent character suddenly doing something incredibly stupid. All right, Chris, what is your second like for Army of the Dead? I love the whole... I love the fact that I think the whole concept kind of clicked. Like, they bl- blended genres. Like, I, I, I totally agree with you. It's not so much like a, a tit-for-tat, like, horror flick. But the fact that they took, like, this heist movie and, and blended it with that that flavor. The whole idea of zombies in Vegas and, like, those bright neon colors. And, like, you have zombies with, you know, Elvis suits on and like you have the go-go dancers like it was so fun and like just like it just it just worked everything clicked and it worked and it was it was just like a really fun film to watch like it was a really enjoyable time yeah you know i love genre blending uh in in general actually seeing horror blended with a heist movie was pretty darn awesome i like to see horror blended with pretty much anything and you know i think snyder has a real knack for like interesting opening scenes he did it in in watchmen uh very very cool opening as you sort of saw the the history of um of superheroes in that world and here too the opening montage of the zombie outbreak taking hold in vegas that's probably one of my all-time favorite movie openings it's it's such a good piece of storytelling in the in the footage that he chose and the shots he used and even the music i mean the whole thing just clicked 
So I wholeheartedly agree, Chris. The, the genre blending is, is a lot of fun here. The movie works perfectly on a conceptual level. And and I really love that opening as well because it starts out with this like couple and we're like, okay, where is this going? And then it, it just blends perfectly and it really sets the scene. And, and and what I also love, it leaves you, you know, hungry for more, pun intended, zombies. But um, <laughs> it, it really just like, I, I need to know more. Where did this one come from? Like, it, so I, I really, really enjoy that opening as well. All right, Dave, what is your second like of the film? You stole this one from me. You You called dibs. I, I call dibs. Uh, it's the zombie tiger, man. I mean, there's something so incredibly cool about zombified animals. Resident Evil famously did it with dogs. And here it's a zombie tiger that used to belong to Siegfried and Roy. I just I just thought that was hilarious. I loved every time the tiger popped up on screen. The reaction from the cast, those reactions were pitch perfect. And the tiger also had one of the most vicious, drawn out and gory kills in the whole movie. Um... It's it's very much uh, what do they call it? Chekhov's gun. You know, you show you show a gun in the opening, then by the end it needs to go off. Well, that tiger went off, all right. Like they teased it, and and we got to see, see that tiger in action. And I'm I'm glad that that they did that. It was a fantastic scene when he finally you know uh, got a meal, so to speak. So yeah, the the zombie tiger was spot on in a movie that had plenty of interesting takes on zombies, particularly that more intelligent variant. More on that later, I think. I thought the tiger really stole the show every time it was on screen, Chris. Oh, absolutely. And that kill that you mentioned is the one that, that I don't know about you, but I was waiting for the whole time. I, I Martin finally got his after after some really nefarious behavior. And you really it's one of those aspects of, of a horror movie um that you there's that one character but like, I can't wait till this dude dies. And 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 to be taken out that way in that fashion by the zombie tiger, it was just so rewarding. And it was it was one of the moments that I stood up and cheered. You know, Garrett Dillahunt kind of confuses me. Uh, as an actor, he's such a chameleon. There are there are things he pops up in where I absolutely adore the guy, and I'm like, ah, he he's just a great guy, and I, you know, I, I love this character. And then he can be such a piece of crap. I mean, I, there's it's so rare to have an actor who can so. Um, draw you in and make you like him and then at the same time be absolutely repulsive in the next movie and just become (laughs) an incredibly hated character he's just such a good character actor like i just could not stand mark what a piece of crap chris yeah that it gets into one of my 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 future points but i totally agree with you all right chris final like fours uh army of the dead uh, well, you, you said that this is not so much, um, you know, a horror movie, but it's 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 very much an action flick, and and where they leaned into those action scenes, I thought it was awesome, and I really loved, particularly the scenes where Batista got to go full, you know, Schwarzenegger Stallone and full action hero. I thought those were the best ones. I I, I love the scene towards the end where he goes in to save his daughter and and Gita, like, I I totally loved it. So the action scenes, I thought that um, they were so rewarding. They were so good and so well thought out and choreographed. And um, my particular favorite character, uh, the the Coyote, the French actress, like, like, I absolutely loved every scene that she was in. I thought she was super compelling, super amazing. And and, um, so every scene that she got to be a badass was really fun as well. I can't argue with that. You know, Zack Snyder really has come full circle in a lot of ways with this movie. His first major movie as a director was a remake of Dawn of the Dead. And although I still prefer the original, I really enjoyed his remake too. At that point, I decided he was a director to watch carefully and seeing him return to zombie movies and nail it again was really nice. You know, I've said it once and I'll say it again. I did not like his take on DC superheroes, but Snyder's a talented dude. More often than not, his non-superhero movies land, and his eye for shooting a good action scene is one of many reasons that that's true. So I can't argue with your point here. The action scenes were really riveting and and very interesting to watch and very well shot as well. All right, Dave, what is your final like of this film? We're going to have to talk about Germans for a second. (laughs) There is a particular joy as a German in encountering a German character in a movie that is not a a Nazi or mad scientist, B, not a complete stereotype, and C, played by an actual German actor. 
And Matthias Schweig Schweighöfer's Dieter was the perfect little surprise in this movie for me. Look, you can believe that Germans are almost always evil Nazis or comically stereotyped in American movies. One of the many reasons I adore Django Unchained is that it refused to go down this road with Christoph Waltz. Army of the Dead gets similar credit for me. Dieter was a much-needed character in this group. He's neither a mercenary nor a gang member. He's just a regular dude who has never killed a zombie, even. He just happens to have a particular set of skills that the team needs. And his bonding with Omari Hardwick's Vandero was particularly fun to watch. Their whole dynamic was really, really well executed. So overall, the movie just didn't take itself too seriously. Dieter was one great indicator of this. I actually found myself laughing out loud in several places in the movie, something I'm not really used to from Zack Snyder movies anymore. Schweighöfer also has me legitimately excited for the prequel, Army of Thieves, which he also directed and follows his Dita character as he gets involved in a different heist in the early days of the Las Vegas outbreak. The movie is already filmed and should be dropping on Netflix later this year, and I find it uh, incredibly exciting, actually. You know, to me, a guy like Schweighöfer is super talented and needs to get more uh, roles in Hollywood. I'm all in on the guy. He's really, really good. Oh, man. Like, I I, I, I was so excited. I think I start. I hit the play button before you, and I was like, just wait. And I was so excited to hear your, your take on this, because particularly my favorite aspect of the film overall. So I didn't want to step. I didn't put this in my likes because I didn't want to step on yours too much. But uh, my overall favorite thing of the film is, is Dieter and Vandero like together, their progression, their growth, which is, is really a testament to the way that they, you know, constructed this film is it's not like a major type of thing and it's not a whole lot of screen time, but the evolution of their relationship going from okay i i get paired with the noob and and vandero as this experienced you know zombie killer is so annoyed that he's got you know the the safe cracker who has absolutely no you know skills when it comes to to physical fighting uh and then when when deer kills his first zombie and he just like starts taunting vandero and like oh not zombie killing material uh <laughs> and then <laughs> you know and then they get to the point where they're like besties and like you know sacrificing you know themselves for one another it's just really really fun and and it was my far and away my favorite aspect of the film yeah, it just it just worked, and like I said, uh, the fact that they made already a, and already filmed it a, a prequel with Schweighöfer makes me very very excited because I really want to see more of that character. See, I had no idea, and so now I'm stoked, and I'm going to be counting the days. I had no idea about that. That's awesome. Oh, there's apparently an an anime uh, an animated prequel coming too that features most of the cast returning to tell the story of the early days of the outbreak in Las Vegas. Uh, so Batista and, and co came in and did some voice work for that as well. That's supposed to drop at some point on Netflix too. All right. That brings us to uh, the, the uncomfortable world of dislikes, Chris. What is something that you did not enjoy about army of the dead? So this was a pleasant surprise. You know, um, I, I wanted to step outside of like my preconceived notions and, and my previous experience with Snyder has not been positive, but I was excited for this film and, Dave, I really struggled to find three things that I really disliked. So um, there were two that stood out and a third one that uh, was was kind of a dislike. So um, the first one that, that really annoyed me is that this was clearly a setup. Like, okay, if you look at Martin for like five seconds, you clearly know that this dude has an ulterior motive or seven. Um, and so like... And and why in the world, if this is Tanaka's own safe, do you even need a safe cracker? I, you know, maybe there's a something I'm missing that I'm not experienced in the world of safe cracking. But shouldn't he just be able to give him the combination to the safe? You would think. <laughs> but um, so th that part was was particularly troublesome. Like as soon as Dieter came on the screen, as much as I love the character. Uh, and again, he was he was one of my favorite aspects of the film overall. I'm like, wait a minute, why do you need a safe cracker if you're breaking into his own safe? So um, yeah, that seemed pretty telegraphed, and the fact that you know nobody really seemed to question any of that aspect, and were completely taken aback when Martin turned on them time and time again uh, was was particularly puzzling to me. Yeah, something was clearly up from the word go, and I was really surprised that only Chambers picked up on it. 
And as I mentioned earlier, I was super disappointed that she didn't use her last words to warn people about Martin. That was a pretty dumb move. I think overall, when it came to the general um, premise of the movie, uh, oftentimes the characters didn't come across as very smart, particularly when it came to Martin. Like, he, he just was playing everybody uh the coyote too i mean she was helping him you know get the the head of that uh female zombie at one point and and then he turns on her and she was all all surprised like dude this 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 guy's been turning (laughs) on people since like you know 20 minutes into the runtime like this is not surprising anybody anymore he's just a piece of crap but nobody picks up on it like that that's really hard for me to believe when it comes to these characters that are you know fairly experienced uh individuals so yeah i i can see why that's you know a dislike of yours chris all right dave what is your first dislike of the film you know it has become a horror movie staple but good god the ending was predictable it was so bleak as soon as they put the team together i looked at my wife and said well they're all gonna die and sure enough basically everybody dies and that this movie needed to have plenty of fuel for the usual deaths in this kind of movie is a given. But the ending of this movie was particularly bleak. It didn't leave a whole lot of room for a sequel that would follow characters we liked in this one. Which is strange, considering it clearly sets up a sequel. So yeah, I wish the movie would have ended on a slightly more positive note. You know, giving us one or two surviving characters that you you know deeply care about and would want to, you know see come back for the sequel as they put some kind of new team together you know have maybe batiste have survived for example spoilers by the way um but just a couple of surviving characters would have made a big difference because now i feel like if they make a sequel it's going to be essentially a a retread you know you're going to get a a new group of people that are going to be put together to do some kind of job in a new city where there's a zombie outbreak and it doesn't leave any room for character growth or progression because you already hit the reset button. Um, So yeah, I I think that's a little disappointing overall. Yeah. I I also found that it was um, unfortunately predictable. The ending. I also thought it was a little bit odd that um, Batista's character would make his daughter kill him. And like, he wouldn't just like off himself if he knew that he was bitten. So I thought that was a little bit messed up. Like, why would you make her do that and go through that trauma that you know that you felt having to kill your wife. So I thought that was a little bit messed up. I did like the um, Vandero ending. I thought that was hilarious. Like he really think that he gets away. And then of course he finds a bite on himself in the mirror. So that was a really funny way to end it. But, but I totally agree with where you're coming from as well. And, you know, I don't mean to sound, you know, cruel or mean or anything, but when it comes to characters that are, you know, smart and capable, those are usually the ones you want to survive. And and we've seen this before when you and I discussed, you know, Night of the Living Dead. Um, and in this case, it's like the one survivor in this whole group is the least competent, the least intelligent. And that's Batista's daughter who goes in there after some, ah, uh, I think we're getting there later. But it's just like <laughs> the, the one survivor is like the person that probably based on her action deserved to survive the least. Like everybody had to die just so she can live. And that 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 is not a very uplifting ending to me. All right, Chris, what is your second dislike of the movie? Well, you just, you just hinted at it. Uh, Kate's motivations and the whole Gita storyline were just wtf um so she gets mad at the coyote for for sneaking her in but that was gita's choice to begin with why why would you be like so angry at gita who left behind her two children to go get what i i'm not sure why she even went in uh maybe i missed that point it clearly wasn't defined enough but um and then, yeah, just like her decision to like with no previous training or experience to just go off on her own for her clearly capable dad that could have gone with her, like all of her decisions to just throw caution to the wind. And I did like her like standing up to her dad. I thought that was a good character moment and a nice little you know, speech from her. But this just the decision making was incredibly stupid. Yeah, you know what, this this whole bit was... Ugh. Look, the the writers clearly wanted the daughter in there with her dad. Why not have her be the one stranded on the inside? 
and it's pretty much a rescue mission for Ward as much as it is a heist. The Gita thing was pretty tired. It was unnecessary. You need to really cut out the middleman on this one. Yeah, absolutely. It was it was just wild. Now, I love that Kate was wearing a shirt during the whole movie that said volunteer. I said to my wife, that's got to be the best volunteer in the history of volunteers. She volunteers to walk into a city full of zombies to rescue one random woman who was too dumb to stay out of a city full of zombies. That's one <laughs> heck of a volunteer, Chris. And completely abandons her kids. But let's get mad at the coyote. Like, let's project all that blame and all that anger on the someone who's just like, listen, this is what she paid me to do, honey. So it really made no sense. Like, where is the the consternation, the anger to Gita, who died at the end anyway? Yeah, very, very successful rescue mission there, lady. Also, Also, how did she escape unscathed from that helicopter crash, but everybody else died? Who knows, man? Who knows? Plot armor. All right. Plot armor. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dave, what is your uh, second dislike of the film? Elephant in the Room Time. This movie relied a lot on CGI and green screen work. Now, ignoring for a moment that Tiknaratu literally had to be filmed separately and inserted into the movie to replace another actor, let's just put that aside. Uh, the CG simply doesn't always land. The movie feels a little fakish in places where a movie about a zombie heist probably shouldn't. Specifically the setting, the background shots of the city, they were not always convincing. You know, I can forgive the zombie tiger not always looking its best since that's a pretty fantastical creature. But you've got to get the setting right. If the audience doesn't believe that these people are actually there, suspension of disbelief when it comes to zombies, you know, riding horses is simply not going to happen. I've grown really tired of substandard CGI ruining horror and horror-adjacent movies for me. I know it's cheaper than other alternatives, but regrettably, more often than not, it also looks cheaper. I miss, you know, more on-location filming and, and, and practical special effects. Those sorts of things, they have a tendency of having real weight. They land better. Um... But yeah, man, some of that CG, particularly in the in the backgrounds of, you know, establishing where they were at, the setting and stuff, didn't quite land, man. Yeah, I, I, I want to be able to chalk this up to, you know, like filming during a pandemic and, and whatnot, but it... I, I don't think there was anything as super egregious to me as there has been in, in previous Snyder properties, but um, it, it really is just a tired thing to uh, as, a, as a moviegoer. Uh, to see bad CGI. So I, I'm a huge fan. We talked about this, uh, you know, to a great extent, you know, always a fan of, of practical effects when possible. All right, Chris, final dislike for Army of the Dead. So this one was the one that I struggled to fill in because there weren't three huge things that I had a problem with this. I've already covered it with my other two. Um, so the slow-mo is is pretty present in this one and i don't think it's as as egregious as in uh you know like the justice league film and and the other snyder creations that i've i've seen but in some ways it works but then um it's like too much of a good thing so in like some of the action scenes it's really cool i like the one where the money is flying in the casino that's cool but then it just gets to the point where like okay you're you're doing that again you're doing that again so again, it's not a huge dislike. It didn't deter me a whole lot, but it was just a little bit repetitive. You know, if you're watching a J.J. Abrams movie, uh, prepare for lens flares. <laughs> if you're watching a Snyder flick, prepare for slow motion. At this point, his overuse of slow motion is almost self-parody. The joke is that otherwise the movie was filmed extremely well. And in places, as you mentioned, the slow-mo worked. Uh, but in other places, it was distracting because it felt like such a cheap amateur move compared to some of his other techniques. Zach, I would love to see you make one movie completely free of slow motion. I honestly believe it would work better, dude. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, Dave, I really am interested to hear your third and final dislike. You know, sometimes a movie leaves you wanting more, and that's really good fuel for a sequel. And at other times it leaves you wanting more because you feel like it was missing an essential ingredient. And in this particular movie, uh, I think the missing ingredient was more uh, information about the zombies. The implication of the movie was that these zombies have built some kind of functioning society that they had a leader who was in love and apparently even reproduced. That's a pretty different take on the zombie genre. And yet it all happens sort of on the periphery of the movie. 
I would have loved to see the movie give us a little bit more information about this zombie society, how, how it functions, how these zombies interact and relate to each other, and what really the underlying rules are, and even what the alpha zombie's actual goal was. I mean, he pops up in, in Vegas, there's just one zombie, he turns really the whole city, the city is walled off, and at that point, his intelligence is well established but his motivation is not is he you know eventually hoping to get out of vegas is he perfectly happy in there and just wants to protect his little society i don't think that was necessarily clear and i would have loved to see more of this this zombie society because it's pretty unique as far as you know the zombie movie genre is concerned it was it was pretty different and i would love more information about it chris yeah, for sure. I I thought that was a really interesting kind of switch up from what I've seen before from zombie flicks. And um, I, I, I definitely wanted more as well. All right. So, Chris, what's your final verdict then for Army of the Dead? What are your thoughts? I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I, I felt I really, really dug this film. It was really fun to see. And I want to see more. I'm going to go uh, probably like a B plus. That's hilarious, dude. For me, the movie was just fun. It was a really good, fun popcorn flick. You know, I know there are plenty of critics who, who took issue with, you know, plot holes, with running time, etc. But I can't lie. I enjoyed myself tremendously watching this one. And in the end, that's what I want when I'm watching a movie. I want to be entertained and I want to have a good time. Even though the ending is not exactly what I wanted, I think the journey was worth taking. So I agree with you. I'd give this one a solid B plus as well. It's just a fun flick, man. All right, folks, that wraps up our big talk, our review of Army of the Dead. Next up, after a quick break, we're back with our final segment, Nerd Commendations. Stick around. G'day. How's it going? Nice to meet you. I'm Stu. I'm Chris. I'm Dave. And we're the Pool Boys. We're the hosts of Pool Pool Boys Boys Recommend. Recommend. It's a podcast where we suggest stuff to each other. We do it and then we review it. You remember like show and tell at school? It's kind of like that, but this week I had a mental breakdown. (laughs) You're a music lover, Stu, okay? I am, yes. What is this going to be? And so I want you to listen to B-52's seminal classic Love Shack. 100 times. Uh, One, oh my God. You know, it's just when you're going to sleep, when you're having a shower. 100 times. 100 times. <laughs> you can start playing it now, maybe. Oh my God. You, you have you're only yourself to blame. If next episode I come back on the air and I'm like, oh, hey, how you going? <laughs> Here's another cheeky little clip for you. <laughs> oh, this podcast is great. That was a dramatization of you enjoying the podcast in the future. When you check out Pool, Pool Boys Recommend. Recommend, find us on Spotify and Stitcher Wishka. and Apple Google Podcasts, podcasts and even our own website. You know where to get podcasts. Come yeah, on. come on. You're listening to one now. Welcome back. You need nerd media, and we have the perfect recommendations for you. It's time for, you guessed it, Nerd Commendations. Nerd Commendations. Chris, what is your nerd commendation for this week? Have you ever wondered what would Mrs. Doubtfire be like if it was rated R and set in the Marvel Universe? Oh, and instead of a cross-dressing Robin Williams, we have a cranially enhanced supervillain as the main protagonist. Modoc tells the story of the titular character struggling through personal and professional mayhem as his company and marriage are simultaneously in shambles. Patton Oswalt delivers a comedic tour de force performance alongside a stellar voice cast including Melissa Fumero of Brooklyn Nine-Nine fame, Amy Garcia, Ben Schwartz, uh... And my personal favorite, John Hamm, Don Draper himself, is Iron Man. Uh, this show is everything that I wanted it to be and more. It's like an R-rated comedic romp through the Marvel Comics universe uh, that is not beholden to continuity in any form or fashion. So I saw Seth Green's name in the credits after the first episode, so the robot chicken vibe that I thought I was seeing was absolutely on point. We also speculated the celebrity deathmatch feel, and it turned out to be even truer than in than I initially anticipated. 
the writing on the show is snappy, witty, and the jokes land with surgical precision. There are Easter eggs galore for longtime comics fans, including names of popular comics creators throughout this throughout the decades. Uh, this is what happens when you let a bunch of hilarious nerds loose on a universe that they love without the constraints of a con- of the continuity of a connected universe or pandering to the normies. So do yourself a favor and support TV's son of TV's Frank and his new project. Just make sure that you put the kids to bed first. You know, man, everything about this just show to screams, Dave. I can't wait to check it out. I'm so glad it turned out well. I'm a pretty big Pat Oswalt fan, and I absolutely adore Robot Chicken. Letting that sensibility run wild across the Marvel Universe seems to me to be the very best possible decision. I've not watched MODOK yet, but it is absolutely at the very top of my list of stuff that I need to check out, Chris. Yeah, it's it's very much, uh, and here's a hot take, Robot Chicken Star Wars is one of my favorite Star Wars you know, entries ever. So if, if you have not seen the Robot Chicken Star Wars, do yourself a favor and check that out as soon as possible. Absolutely, man. All right, Dave, you are completely going left field again. What do you have for us this week? That should be my middle name at this point, left <laughs> field. All right, so, you know, I love action-adventure games in the vein of The Legend of Zelda. Always have, always will. It's kind of in my DNA at this point. So I recently came across a game that scratched that itch so perfectly, I absolutely have to nerd commend it. And that game is called Blossom Tales, The Sleeping King. So here's the official description. Explore a vast open world uh, in classic action-adventure fashion as Lily, Knight of the Rose. Slash your way through monster-infested dungeons to save the kingdom of Blossom from eternal darkness. Collect unique weapons, spells, and items during your journey to take down powerful bosses and solve clever puzzles. Be part of a vivid, dynamic story passed down from grandfather to grandchildren by influencing the course of events yourself. The game is strongly influenced by the SNES Zelda game A Link to the Past. It really wears this influence on its sleeve. Many of the gameplay elements could be directly tied to a Zelda game. The combat, the unique items assigned to specific buttons, the environmental puzzles. The game looks gorgeous, perfectly capturing that 16-bit SNES feel. The music pops, and the controls are responsive, and the gameplay is just plain fun. The game also has a great sense of humor that goes a long way to help everything click with players. Uh, It features about 15 hours of gameplay, which makes it the perfect little Zelda-style game to fill up some free time. Now, I played this on Switch, where it is available in the digital storefront. It can be also purchased on Steam for PC. The portability of the Switch, I think, makes it the superior way to play this one, though, Chris. Oh, yeah, man. This absolutely scratches that itch. I'm playing Link's Awakening right now uh, in my free time, and this, this harkens right to that as well. Yeah, these kinds of games are always a really, really good time. Well, that's it for another episode of the Nerd Byword. If you enjoy our show, please drop a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. We're, of course, available wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, Amazon Music, Audible, and, of course, our very own website, nerdbyword.com. And be sure to check us out on social media. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at NerdByWord. And be sure to send us a photo of your subscription proof, and we will send you a code for a free digital comic. You can also find us individually on those platforms at that nerd Dave and at that nerd Chris. Uh, and as always, stay well and stay nerdy. The Nerd By Word is written and produced by Chris and Dave, two nerds with a love of all things pop culture. The podcast features music by Al Jimenez with additional drops composed by Joe Biondi. Our show art is by Ashery Design. Find us at nerdbyword.com and wherever podcasts are available. Mm-hmm.